Today we are um, we are lucky to have Craig Thompson, who is the executive director of the Transportation Development Association of Wisconsin. And um, I'm going to do announcements a little bit later because Craig actually has um, some place he needs to get to. He has a fabulous ten-year-old child who would really like him to get back to Madison and pick him up. So um, I'm going to introduce Craig and let him have um, some time with you. Thank you very much, Lynn. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you this morning, and I also know that uh, you're all very busy and you've got a, a very uh, full agenda. Before John told me after 10 minutes, I actually would drop through the floor, so I'm, I am going to move on. And then I didn't even notice saying that I'm uh, immediately following me as Congressman Petri, which makes me uh, even that much more humble than want to move along because, uh, uh, quite honestly, I don't know of anybody else in their career that has done more uh, for the subject that I'm about to talk about, which is transportation in the state of Wisconsin than, than Congressman Petri has. So, I will be brief. Uh, you, you, you have a sheet of paper before you at, at your table, and what I'm here to tell you about is when you go to the ballot box in November to vote for uh, governor and for legislators and, and local races, there's also going to be a question on your ballot and all the ballots across the state asking whether or not uh, you would support amending uh, Wisconsin's state constitution uh, basically to, to ensure that the transportation user fees you pay in the form of, of the car registration fee and gas tax has to stay in the transportation budget and be used for transportation purposes and that it cannot be diverted to be used for other purposes. The, the actual question as it will appear on the ballot is on the uh, right hand side there. I'm not going to read that all to you though, but it is the actual language that would go in the constitutional legal jargon, but the net effect is is that it would require that those dollars have to be spent on transportation. So uh, why why is this question on the, on the ballot in the first place? Uh, Wisconsin, uh, as some other states in this country, although I will mention that a lot of other states in this country went through this and then changed it because the majority of states in the United States right now already have language in their constitution uh, stipulating where transportation user fees can go, including the majority of our neighbors here uh, in the Midwest. But in Wisconsin in the early 2000s and into the early to mid-2000s, uh, as we had problems in, in the general fund uh, in, in making ends meet, uh, through the course of really three different budgets, we, we reached into the transportation fund and used some of that money to try to help each time on a one-time basis, balance the fund in the, in the general fund, um, and to the tune of, of about one point, just about one and a half billion dollars uh, that we did that with. Now, there, that does not mean there was a one and a half billion dollar loss to the, to the transportation fund. It was a good majority of that money really was replaced in the transportation fund, uh, but with, with general obligation bonds that were issued and the debt service being paid out of the general fund. So, to us, the net effect was several things. It really eroded the confidence of the public uh, that their transportation user fees were being paid for being used on what, what they were intended to be used for, which is the upkeep of our transportation system. And, and the erosion of that trust has led to, to other things that, that, that we believe have, have caused some problems with funding and transportation. And on the general fund side, uh, well, while we used that to try to fill in some holes for a couple specific budgets, we're going to be paying for that for quite some time. Uh, this last budget that just passed, there was $350 million in there of our general fund money that was going to pay the debt service for those past transfers. There'll be that similar amount the next budget, and the budget after that, and the budget after that. And we, we really don't think that's a very good idea. As a matter of fact, either did, either did Moody's uh, when they downgraded our, our bond rating after that, citing that as one of the reasons. And the National Peace Center of the States talked about Wisconsin getting itself in trouble because of that as well. Now, we have not transferred funds out for the last several budgets, uh, but we do believe it's important to ensure that, that, the, that the public and the motoring public has confidence that we won't get into doing this again. And one of the reasons that it is very tempting to do it out of transportation, uh, so one of the questions we've had is, well, why, why just protect the transportation fund? What about any segregated funds? Um, there have been some other segregated funds that have been used, uh, none of them anywhere near the dollar amount from the transportation fund. The other one, which still wasn't even close, but at some level was the patient's compensation fund, and that has already been, that's been litigated and, and resolved. The, the reason that the transportation fund is, it can be tempting is really in our, in the initial language of Wisconsin's constitution, 
uh, it spells out what elected officials can bond for and what they cannot. And what it says you can bond for is capital improvements such as roads and, and, and things like that. Uh, you're not, you can't bond for ongoing operations for what I think we all hope are pretty obvious reasons. Well, what we did, what I talked about before, was we took a certain amount out of the transportation fund, and then whatever hole was there, or some amount of that, then we said, we're going to bond to pay for infrastructure for that difference. So technically, we were bonding to pay for what was, what was allowed, which was infrastructure, but really, we just found kind of a, a way to get around really bonding for ongoing operations. And so um, it, it, it takes that, that ability away. Some have said, uh, at the time, for a while, some said, but do we really want to limit the flexibility of our elected officials to respond to different things? Um, my answer to that is, in this instance, yes, we do. We, we actually have to absolutely do it. Because uh, we're, we're going to be paying, rather than having to make the hard decisions about uh, raising more money or, or reducing the level of spending, this really was an easier way out for at the time, but one that, that we believe we're going to be paying for for a long time. And so um, we formed a coalition. You'll see on the back now the number of groups that are, that are members of this coalition now, and they range way beyond groups that are transportation to statewide groups and grocers and housing and retailers and National Federation of Independent Businesses, quite a few chambers of commerce across the state, um, peer groups of yours. And, and we asked the legislature to, the only way this is, the only way you can amend the Constitution of Wisconsin is two ways. One is a constitutional convention, which has never happened. And the second is the legislature has to vote in two consecutive sessions on the same piece of legislation without amendment. And if they do that, then, then the question will go on the ballot for the voters. So it's a pretty arduous process to go through. It doesn't happen terribly often. Uh, back in 2010, in order to sort of really get this going, uh, we asked county governments in the state uh, to put an advisory referendum on their ballots asking the public whether they would support a constitutional amendment to protect the transportation fund. Uh, it, 58 of the 72 counties did that. It, it was on the ballot here in Sheboygan um, in 2010. And uh, in all 58 counties that it was on, it passed overwhelmingly, and the average statewide vote was 70% yes. Uh, subsequent to that, the legislature voted uh, in a very large bipartisan fashion, 80, 80, 83 to 13 in the Assembly and 26 to 6 in the Senate, uh, to pass first consideration. And they came back and voted in equally large bipartisan fashion this last session uh, to pass second consideration, which means it goes on the ballot. And I do want to mention all of all the legislators here in your area uh, were, were uh, voted yes on that and, and helped to move that forward. So that's that's how we got here. That's how the question is going to be on. Uh, we ask that you vote yes uh, for some of the reasons that I just outlined. There's a lot more background and reasons if you go to the website, uh, voteyesfortransportation.com. Which is, which is on the sheet of paper here. Um, I will tell you, uh, in addition to it passing well in 2010 in the, in the legislature, we did go out and do some polling um, earlier in, in December, and we are still feel very confident where the public's at. We still have very strong numbers for support from the public across parties, across age groups, across geography in the state. Uh, so, but we still feel it's important that we get out and inform people that it's going to be on the ballot so that there's no misunderstanding. No misunderstanding of that. We don't want to be complacent. Uh, we won't be running a huge campaign that generally you think of for statewide for something like this. You probably won't see a lot of TV ads or, or that sort of thing. It really is going to be more grassroots, getting out, talking to groups like yours, making sure that if there are any questions that we answer them and that people just understand why it's on here and what it is. And for the most part, what we also found out through that polling and Adam Payne and I were just talking about this, the public just feels that it is just common sense. This is what the money was supposed to be used for. That, that's what it should be used for, and so, quite frankly, that's what you'll see in a lot of our, of our messaging. So with that, I will try to uh, close my comments and take any questions if there are. Any. If not, I guess my one ask would be if you consider, as I mentioned, there's quite a few chambers around the state uh, that have signed on in support of this. We're not asking for any money or anything like that, just that uh, if you're interested, if you support it, we would list you as a supporter and we would share all of our materials that they could be sent out via your email communications and newsletters and, and things like that. So with that, I will end and let, let the congressman follow me. Thank you very much.
drive safely on your way back. We, we want to make sure that our transportation person gets back safely. So this is very important in the Boise roads. Um, next we have, we are very um, honored to have Congressman, Congressman Petri here with us um, today to give us a little speech. And um, he also has a friend with him, so he possibly might bring up his friend um, if you all give him a nice round of applause. Thank you. I, I wasn't going to bring my little friend with me, but uh, if any of you have kids in school, they're doing these things. Now, this is called Flat Stanley, uh -huh. and uh, there was a bear for a while, also, and this sort of thing. And uh, the kids over in uh, Wild Rose Grade School, uh, I went over there in a couple of weeks to do you know, a day visiting the Wild Rose, Rose School System, and they uh, it colored this up and made it up in one flat Stanley to spend a day in the district traveling around with me and then visit Washington and then for me and flat Stanley to come back and report with the pictures on all that. So he got to attend the meeting and had his picture taken in front of the TV cameras in the back and he got to meet uh, Dan Lenehu and uh, all kinds of other exciting people. And, uh, and he's been to Sheboygan. He hasn't had a Broadhurst yet, though. But anyway, <laughs> anyway that's, that's what my, my friend is all about. I, I, uh, I, I just, just a word or two, we have a couple other uh, presenters from the State Senate and from the uh, State Assembly, things going on in Madison, and, and it's the off year, but they're dealing with a lot of, of uh, uh, different issues. The national level, uh, the President just submitted his budget, March 4th, and uh, that's a huge uh, sort of document. It's more of a wish list than it is necessarily a plan in Washington. A lot of times, whether it's a, if you have a Democratic uh, Congress and a Republican president or vice versa, people say, well, it's been on arrival. But it, it is nonetheless important because it does provide uh, different ideas and things that they're working on. and. And some, some of the things do, do make it into law as the process goes forward. And as we know, it's been a pretty complicated and somewhat dysfunctional process in Washington where we're not doing the regular order on a lot of the budgeting, but doing ex uh, extensions and all the rest. But I just thought I'd touch on a couple of the highlights there and then talk a little bit about transportation. Uh, the, uh, uh, the basically, the uh, uh, budget uh, would continue with. Uh, uh, provide for deficit spending uh, as for the, through 19, 2024, would establish a federal universal preschool program, expand the earned income tax credit for workers living in households with no children, fully fund the highway trust fund, but not with a dedicated revenue, but with, from corporate tax uh, reform, uh, would uh, uh, extend emergency unemployment benefits for for one year would provide for uh, doubling the excise tax on cigarettes and then indexing that to the rate of inflation, uh, try, try to a number of corporate tax reforms that would produce additional, uh, additional revenue and a new tax on large financial institutions. Uh, so that, those are some of the highlights. There are a lot of other things in it. Uh, the, the thing that I might was going to mention, we talking about transportation here. I've been chairman of the highway uh, uh, committee in the House of Representatives for many years, and that is a one of these things. It's not a particularly partisan thing. We all we know one of the basic jobs of government is to help provide, uh, for, whether it's at the local level or at the national level, uh, for, for basic uh, transportation infrastructure and and. Uh, the uh, federal government has provided a framework. Uh, it's a federal, state, local partnership. We normally pass a bill for six years, and it's very important that we do that because it takes a year or two when they sort of set up the parameters in Washington, then the state departments have to work that through, and the legislature work on their budgets and all those projects, and the counties, and so on and so forth. And if we start de degenerating into doing these short-term, year, two-year, short-term extensions, 
what will happen is it will make the, that investment less efficient because of the stopping and starting, which is hard to do, and, and the states uh, and, and other units of government will tend to start delaying major projects because they're not sure if they're going to be able to fund them. Uh, we are, uh, the current program expires at the end of September, so we've been having hearings uh, for the last uh, year or two uh, on reauthorization and working on it. The uh, good news is that it's not partisan. The administration and, and the new Secretary of Transportation, a fellow named Fox from North Carolina, been over meeting with us. They really want to be part of trying to work out something. Uh, the bad news is that the federal program has traditionally been funded by user fees, gasoline and diesel fuel tax, and there's a tire tax and some other taxes on the trucking industry. And uh, of course, we all know that it's a good thing that vehicles are more fuel efficient, uh, but that means that it, it generates less revenue, and the economy's been down some, and there's a lot of work being done on alternative fuels. And so the bottom line is that the projections are, we do a new bill for the next six years. The revenue coming in from the uh, traditional streams of uh, gas tax and diesel fuel tax will only cover about 60% of the current total. So one idea would be to cut it back 60% and turn back to the state so you guys can raise the money to pay for it. Uh, <coughs> which is not, never pleasant. Uh, the, uh, another possibility, uh, and that basically what we've been doing is saying every, all options are on the table. We're trying to work this thing through. The federal, federal, last time the federal government's, federal gas tax is now about 18.3 cents a gallon. I think the state tax is around 26 or 28 cents a gallon. It's not been changed since 1993, and it's not indexed. So that's the best part of the problem with the other things we mentioned. The National American Association of Truckers, whose job is not to make life more expensive or difficult for their members, uh, came in and uh, asked that we raise the diesel fuel tax on the trucking, on, on their members, uh, because they need roads. They looked at all the all other alternatives. They're very afraid that their members are going to get nickels and dimes with increased tolling and other things that may force them off the interstate and all the rest of it. So they find that they're studying it and reviewing it uh, have come in and said that's what they, they want us to do. Uh, we're likely to, but, but we're trying to, the president is suggesting uh, maybe using corporate taxes or other things. The program it is, it works better at the state level and certainly at the federal level if there's a dedicated stream of revenue like gasoline or diesel fuel tax because uh, at the state level and at the community level, part of this program, uh, which may be controversial in some areas, but is, is, is an important part, is, is about 20% of it is mass transit. And what the states and local, like I was just on in Dallas meeting with them, a number of these places are uh, uh, go to Denver. So they're busy trying to expand their mass transit because they don't want to have too much urban sprawl, they have to start growing up. They have fixed transit, they can, developers can build buildings around the stop, and so it's a big boost for economic development. Uh, if they get a federal commitment or some small portion of the money for a number of years for them to do one of these transit projects, they actually can bond against that revenue because it's from a dedicated source and multiply that initial investment a great deal. Uh, but they can't if it's subject to annual appropriation by the Congress. People aren't going to issue bonds based on a vote every year by, by a, a legislature. So when you get into the dynamics of how it works, it really makes the whole thing work a lot better uh, if we can have some kind of a trust fund stream of revenue. So that's what we'll be wrestling with. The likelihood is that the project we thought we'd get through this year, but now they're saying we may run out of revenue just to keep the current program going sometime in July or August. Uh, of this year, so there may be one of these crises, and hopefully everyone will bang on us to figure out how to get some program uh, in place to to uh, move forward. Uh, one two or two other things, real quickly. I have been chairman of that committee for 12 years, or ranking Republican, and then was in aviation, and back now with this Congress, 
uh, on the surface transportation thing. And of course, you pull away from something and then you move, come back, things change. And two things that really struck me, I had these talking points, and I would say 50,000 people a year die on the nation's highways. The answer now is it's more like 30,000. It's becoming much safer with better design, with better vehicles, uh, uh, and uh, more electronics moving into these vehicles. Uh, it's, it's really uh, amazing. And the, the second thing is that we're having hearings and briefings discussing technology and transportation more and more. Uh, there's a dedicated part of the spectrum for service vehicles. Uh, they're putting thousands of computer chips into these things. They're already, they already, there's competition going on between Google and the traditional auto industry to develop autonomous vehicles. Uh, if you fly frequently, you gradually become aware of the fact that the planes fly themselves. Pretty much they can say the pilot doesn't necessarily have to take off or land and let no flight. The machines will do it. And that has huge implications for the trucking industry. That it will revolutionize the way we think about transportation and we organize, I think, over time cities and our lives as much as the development of the world did 100, 100 years ago when we moved to cars. So it's actually a very interesting and exciting thing. They think it's going to be happening faster rather than slower, not overnight, but they're layering this tech. If you buy an expensive car now, they have to park themselves, you can go on to Autobahn and push it and it will drive itself Super highway type situation, slowing up and speeding down and keeping track of things. Uh, but uh, they do expect this technology to be layering in increasingly uh, over the next five or ten years, and, and uh, these single autonomous vehicles that do exist will suddenly start becoming more and more available. Uh, uh, so it's a whole new different world out there. It's kind of exciting to have the opportunity to be part of it and <coughs> make sure that. As best we can, we we uh, provide a, a good framework for people to be innovative and and, and uh, responsibly develop this technology. Anyway, thank you for giving me a chance to work with this. So um, first we have um, Representative Ensley, Mike Ensley. We have the retiring representative, um, Glenn Hugh, and he actually is going to be in his term ends in January, correct? So he's with us only for a short while. Um, and then we have um, State Senator Joe Leghorn, and oh, there you are. I, I can see behind John. So if you come up, and did, did uh, Senator Grogan show up? Okay. So um, we are, unfortunately, Steve Castle is normally here with us, but um, our, our representative Steve Castle is ill today, so he is not able to be in attendance with us. Um, these gentlemen are going to be uh, splitting their time with each other, so... Um, we all got to get along. You all got to get along, that's true. Yeah. Does everybody have one of Senator... Hand out. Let's see. Tell you what. I'll let you start. I'll just start with a very pretty simple view, um, and that is uh, when I first ran for office two and a half years ago, um, especially when I was out in more of the rural area and started to talk to some of the farmers. But the first thing that, other than the fact that I knew that driving around and showing the county with the roads that were, weren't in very good shape. But once I got out into the townships, I realized that uh, talking to the various town board members and town chairmen and things, that uh, obviously a, an urgent issue was the fact that uh, over the last many decades, the agriculture equi agricultural equipment um, has gotten significantly larger and significantly heavier. Um, and at the same time, it's taking a, a greater toll on, on, the, uh, on the infrastructure everything from the roads and the bridges and culverts and things like that. Um, maybe my uh, 
associates here will comment a little bit further. I mean, one of the things we're doing right now is there's a, a bill out there uh, called the uh, Implements of Husbandry, which is uh, addressing this exact issue. And that is, what are we going to do about the fact that um, a lot of our rural roads in the agricultural areas are, are deteriorating at, at a much, much faster pace uh, due to the size and the weight of the equipment. Um, I guess in addition to that, um, and, and uh, Craig had commented on it before, um, the bottom line is that um, the funding source for maintaining our infrastructure um, with regard to the uh, uh, registration fees and the gas tax um, aren't keeping up with the levels that they have in the past. And things like the uh, hybrid cars and electric cars and just significantly more fuel efficient cars obviously <coughs> don't require that type of, uh, uh, that is much fuel, I should say, and that's uh, where we're not keeping up. So uh, it's a task that uh, doesn't have a lot of easy answers. Um, you know, we're, we're working with them, but, but the fact remains that the infrastructure is a priority and we need to uh, put together a strategy to maintain the funding that we need. Thank you. You're tiring, right? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> just saving it for after I talk, I think is what it is. So, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be with you again. I'm Joe Lightbottom. I represent the 9th Senate District, which includes most of Sheboygan County, Southern Manitowoc County, and uh, the Hilbert, Potter, Chilton area of Calumet County. And it's always great to stop and by and give updates to not only this chamber group, but I think one of the things that we enjoy best about our legislative responsibilities is having the ability to communicate and talk with the people that we represent about what's happening in your state government, in your state capital. And I think all my colleagues would agree that there is a lot happening in the Capitol uh, at this time. The winter spring session is nearing an end, and there are a lot of proposals that legislators have been working on for almost two years now that they would like to see come to fruition before uh, this voting period comes to an end. And so yesterday I was, well, actually Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of this week, I've been in hearings basically from 8.30 in the morning until you know, 5.30 in the afternoon, and uh, bills are just making their way, way through for final consideration. Without a doubt, the main focus of the Senate and the legislature as a whole and Governor Walker over the past couple of months has been uh, in regard to the positive fiscal situation that the state of Wisconsin finds itself, finds itself in. Because of, I think, continued fiscal discipline and budget management at the state capitol, and because of the fact that our economy in Wisconsin is growing, better than actually we anticipated it would be just a couple of months ago. Uh, we now in Wisconsin are projected to have a billion dollar budget surplus in the current two year budget that we're currently in, it's the 13-15 budget. So, you know, right there, I would stand up and celebrate and say, gone are the multi-billion dollar deficit days that we've lived through in this state for years, almost 15 years. Have, under the last two budgets, uh, that we've been in charge of, the state has been running in the black and it has had surplus budgets. And again, the current projection is that if everything continues as is foreseen, uh, we would have about a billion dollars of more revenue coming in to the capital than what we had planned for when we passed the budget. The governor, the assembly, and the senate have said, you know what, we passed the budget, we feel good about the sustainable and good investments that we made in government programs, hundreds of millions of dollars more for our public schools, hundreds of millions of dollars more for Medicaid and medical assistance programs, hundreds of millions of dollars more for government programs and services. Those are all covered in the budget. This revenue surplus goes beyond that. And we think we should slow down that revenue stream. We should let the people of the state, the hardworking people of the state who are earning the income taxes or the businesses that are generating the corporate taxes, we want you to keep that money instead of having it come down to state government first. And so last week and a couple weeks earlier in the assembly, and I think just earlier this week or so, Governor Walker signed a number of special <laughs> session bills into law. Has he signed them? Yeah, there's so much going on, I don't even remember if he signed them. But they're on his desk, I believe. Yeah. And because we just did that on Tuesday, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. So it comes back by you guys for a little bit. There you go. So in a couple of days, the governor will be signing, really, an impressive tax relief package for the citizens of this state. About $900 million of money will be kept in your pockets instead of coming down to the state capital. Like I said, we're slowing down that stream of revenue 
that was projected to come in over the next two years. Uh, the focus of the, of the bills that we passed are in property tax relief. We will basically commit about $400 million of additional state money to our technical college system over the next year. And that will mean the technical colleges will levy less on the property tax bill in 2014. And so every property tax, average property in Wisconsin, will see a reduction in their property taxes by about $100 in 2014 because we're going to offset <coughs> levy revenue for the technical colleges with state money. And again, that will result in about $100 for the average property in Wisconsin. We then focused on income taxes. And we did a lot with income taxes in the state budget. We lowered every income tax bracket just back in June. And people are going to see the benefits of that uh, in this year. Every income tax bracket was lowered. But in this uh, bill now, with the projected surplus, again, to help you keep more of your money, we're further lowering the lowest income tax bracket in Wisconsin. So those people earning $15,000 or less will have their rate drop from 4.25 down to 4%. It actually impacts everybody, though, because we have an escalating income tax in Wisconsin. So the first $15,000 that you earn will be taxed a little bit less as well. But we really kind of geared this towards the low-income people of the state. You know, in, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a huge savings. They'll save about $60 in income taxes this year. But I don't know. I talked to a lot of low-income families, and $60 is a welcome $60, you know, that's, that can help with a higher heating bill or with a medical expense that they weren't anticipating because of the changes in health care, whatever it may be. Um, I'm not going to apologize for getting those people $60 back in the income that they've earned. And then, for everybody, uh, the governor and the legislature have agreed to update our withholding tables for income taxes in Wisconsin. And this will happen beginning <laughs> in April. So in April, our income tax withholding tables will be updated and that means that the average income earner in there in Wisconsin will pay $58 less, or will keep $58 more of your income in every month you check. And that equates to about $600 for the average family that you'll keep and never send down to the state capital. Uh, so you add that all up, and that's $100 in property tax relief, almost $700 in income tax relief. I mean, that's a, that's a nice chunk of money that the good, hard-working, middle-class families of Wisconsin are going to be able to keep over the next year instead of having it sent down to the state capital. In addition to that, again, we've invested an additional $35 million with this surplus into worker training initiatives. You know, I just met with uh, one of the largest employers in our community a couple of weeks ago. They're struggling to hire 20 people because the skill set just isn't there. And we're talking about wages of $15 to $23 an hour. Uh, so we want to continue to work with businesses to help them to find the people that they need to fill the jobs that are there. So we're investing $35 million more into worker training initiatives. One of the cool parts of it, too, is that a chunk of that is dedicated to helping more people with disabilities get employed. I don't know if any of you have the chance to spend time at RCS or groups like Hearthstone. Uh, the opportunity to have a person who has a disability but has huge ability to help them find a job is just so rewarding, and a big chunk of that money is going to go to helping more people with disabilities get jobs. And then to maintain our fiscal stability, again, you know, we're pretty proud of what's happened in this state. Gone are the multi-billion dollar deficit days. We're now in, in running in the black. We don't want to mess that up. So we hold on to a chunk of that projected surplus as well. It's about $100 million that we hold on to and say, let's just, let's not, you know, lose the momentum that we've gotten here. So if an unexpected expenditure comes up or if the economy does dip over the next couple of months, we've got $100 million that we can work with and not have to go back to you as taxpayers and say, hey, we've got to raise taxes at this time. And with that, I should also mention that in addition to that $100 million, we have $254 million right around there in our state's rainy day contingency budget fund. When we took office in 2011 with Governor Walker, there was $2 million in the rainy day fund. I've got this in my hand, though. $2 million, I think it is. $2 million in the rainy day fund. Right, $2 million. We've now uh, increased that to $279 million, excuse me. That's the largest balance in the state's rainy day fund in the history of the state of Wisconsin. We think that's an appropriate amount. Again, we don't want to put more money in there than that's necessary, because that means we're taking more of your money and having government hold on to it. And we'd rather let you uh, use that money and uh, have that to be able to you know, support your family or businesses. 
There's a lot else that's going on. I, I try to keep it informed so this handout can give you a little bit of an overview about what I've worked on. I wanted to mention, though, as well, the supporting local jobs part that I have in the handout, because I think this is important for business people like yourself to understand. The state of Wisconsin, over the past year, has worked with a lot of good local businesses in providing assistance, tax credit support, low-income loans, whatever it may be. And this is just a list um, that WBDC and um, maybe like the Wisconsin Housing and Economic Development Organization have worked with here in the Sheboygan area. And some people have criticized that. You know, they're saying the legislature has been focused on helping the corporate elite, the wealthy corporate people of our state. That's what their argument is. Well, this is the corporate wealthy that we're trying to help. These are the businesses of Sheboygan, Manitowoc, and Calumet County that want to continue to operate here and create jobs here, employ people here, and what we do is provide them with some tax incentives, some incentive to stay growing there. You know, Venus right here in Sheboygan County, and Sheboygan Falls is a, is a real good example. Venus Manufacturing employs hundreds of people here in our community, important business. They get support from the state hundreds of thousands of dollars over the past year to help them continue to grow in this area and bring more jobs to this area. In addition, Bemis is the main benefactor of the investment that the state of Wisconsin has made in the Plymouth to Sheboygan Falls rail line. I think that's $14 million of state tax money is going into that rail line. And that's the help of business like Bemis Manufacturing. That's the money that we are putting into helping businesses. And again, that gets criticized, but I think you need to bring it home to understand that these are the people that work at Bemis, these are the people that work at Booth, these are the people that work at Rockline. That's who we're working to try to help here. And I think that's a smart and a worthy investment because when those businesses do well, they continue to pay taxes to the state, they employ more people, we're going to pay back taxes to the state. That's going to help us to maintain the good fiscal balance that we've been able to do in the state of Wisconsin. So that, I know everybody's looking forward to questions, and now Dan's going to rebut and have a chance to say something. Thanks. Thanks. The last few times we've been at the uh, Chamber of First Friday, uh, we've had five of us here, so we've taken one representative, one senator to give updates, and then just ask for questions. So it didn't take long. There's only three of us, so I'll, I'll, I'll grab the mic for just a minute or two. Uh, <clears throat> the session is near an end. Uh, this time next month, um, we'll be done. Uh, there are two four session days left, and then, and then the first week in April to sort of get the bills that, uh, like, like the surplus bill that we passed in the assembly a few weeks ago, and now the Senate passed it. Uh, there's, there's one minor difference in it, so now it has to go back to the assembly. And we either take that amendment or we take it off with our Senate friends, and, and, but try to reach agreement then on what we're sending to the governor. It has to be identical from both houses. So that first week in April, we'll leave open to, uh, to for these bills to go back and forth and, and we'll get some resolution. Uh, as, as the senator said, there's a, there's a number of bills out there that that um, we haven't gotten resolution on that aren't ready to go to either house. Uh, I don't know if we will get that done in the next two weeks. If not, then we start over again. Somebody starts over again next week in next January. And uh, with, with some of those same issues, we're trying to get a resolution on them. Uh, we have we have several issues. The uh, the, the farm implements, the egg implements on, on the road is, is a big deal for, for towns and, <clears throat> and, for, and for the egg community uh, so that they can uh, continue to conduct their business. Uh, it's important for, for the gravel pits and, and, and those types of trucks that are going on town roads all the time to get some resolution on that issue. Um, we, you've heard a lot about Common Core. Uh, we haven't reached a resolution on, on how to deal with that issue. We haven't reached a resolution on, on school accountability, where we hold not only choice schools and charter schools, but public schools accountable for their performance and if they're actually teaching the kids what they should be teaching them. And, and are we getting the results that, that uh, the millions and millions of dollars that are put into education? Are we getting the results that we want in our public schools, charter schools, and choice schools? Uh, so there, there's a number of issues out there, and, and yes, there's a lot of work being done in Madison, and, and we're trying to get a resolution on those. Um, I was at a council association meeting last night in, in Finley County, and, and the uh, county administrator of Finley County was, was, I won't say he was complaining, but he was concerned about the number of uh, baby boomers that were starting to retire and, and, and the need to replace them. 
Well, I'd just like to say that I'm leading the charge of the baby boomers. <laughs> and I'm seeking to retire. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm proud of that, uh, that I'm doing that. And uh, uh, so I'm looking forward to retirement. Uh, I just want to say that, that um, uh, organizations like this, uh, the business community, the chambers, uh, I've represented parts of five counties over the actually six counties over the uh, over the 12 years. And uh, there's groups like this throughout the district, throughout this part of the state, that are so very important for uh, the success of legislators. Uh, the input we get from groups like this, the, uh, the give and take we can have with the business community is so very important uh, because quite often legislators do not come from that background. They do not come from the business background and, and uh, um, a lot of them um, start out as staffers and, and interns and, and spend a lot of time in the public sector and don't have that business background. So it's, 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 it's been refreshing to over the last 12 years, uh, well actually for the last 26 years, 26 years uh, in county government and state government to have a relationship with the business community and know that, uh, that the business community is willing to step up and, uh, and let their voices be heard and that's a good thing and you need to continue to do that. Um, I don't know if, if, if this seat will be filled with somebody from Sheboygan County. My district now uh, has very little Sheboygan County actually other than where I live. Um, it goes all the way from Hartford up to New Holstein. And um, I have, uh, I should say I have, uh, six individuals have contacted me interested in the, in the position. One of them is from, from uh, the part of Sheboygan County that's in the district, but it's, it's such a small portion of it. It's, very, it's going to be very hard for somebody to win that seat from Sheboygan County in the future. So um, uh, you would still have a representative, obviously, for that part of the county, but you may not live in town. Uh, so with that, um, we'll open it up for questions, and um, we'll all be happy to answer the questions, but feel free to ask your questions. I don't know if somebody from the chamber is going to run this, but uh, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll call in. While you're thinking of questions, I'll jump in because one uh, bit of information that I forgot to mention uh, is in regard to transportation. And uh, part of the effort that we've been working on over the past couple of weeks has been related to the transportation budget as well. Again, we are projecting that we'll have about a billion dollars of extra revenue in the general fund of the state of Wisconsin. But then as Craig mentioned, and as I'm hoping you're understanding, we have a separate transportation budget. And along with the surplus projection in the general fund, there is a projection that the transportation fund will see a surplus of about $80 million uh, in the remainder of this budget. And so what we did, or what we're going to do next week, Tuesday, I think, in the Senate, and you guys have done it already, is we commit about $35 million of that projected $80 million surplus in the transportation fund to more road projects in the state of Wisconsin to move forward some of the important highway projects that have kind of gotten a little bit behind uh, over the past uh, couple of years. Uh, that doesn't unfortunately mean 23 directly, but uh, it will help uh, as 23 continues to be on target for 2015. I will share um, that myself and a couple of senators are looking to see if there is something that we can do for some local road dollars as well, because counties and local towns and municipalities are struggling with some maintenance costs, and it's just been enhanced with the winter. Uh, so we're trying to see if there's some that we, something that we can do next Tuesday to, to maybe help our talk. We, in the budget that we passed, we do help out the towns and the municipalities uh, with a nice increase, but we're looking to see if anything more can be done there before uh, we leave the session. So with that, questions? I actually have yes. a question. Uh, it, so, you know, um, not, we were just talking about how in the city and the state of New Jersey, we talk about um, with all the... Uh, Some of us get calls, even on municipal issues, <laughs> to get a call. But that's really a local government issue. I mean, we provide support to local communities and to counties through a number of different dollar streams. But you know, local infrastructure would be a responsible responsibility of the local government. <laughs> Yes, Charles. Mr. Clark, with the surplus, you said it's increased revenues more than expected. Did you change your budgeting from the previous uh, two-year annual budget that reduced what you expected to get or the 
Well, I mean, if you haven't realized, you've got a conservative group of people leading the legislature right now and a conservative governor. So when we passed our budget back in June, we did that with conservative budget projections for revenue. Part of the problem that we've gotten, part of the problem why we've gotten into messes in the past with these multi-billion dollar deficits is that even when the Fiscal Bureau was telling the legislature that revenue growth was only going to go up by 2%, the legislature and the past governors would pass budgets that thought they were going to spend 4% or get 4% or 5% new revenue. And that would that led to the deficit problem. So, you know, that's been a big change. We've been much more disciplined and conservative in our budgeting. Uh, since Governor Walker and, and the Republican legislature took charge in 2011. So we, we tightened up those revenue estimates back in June when we passed the budget, and because of the fact that, again, income taxes are up, corporate taxes are up, sales taxes are up, excise taxes are up, everything's coming in a little bit better than what we had anticipated. And so that accounts for about 800 million of the, or 700 million of the projected surplus, and then on top of that, I mean, we maintain good budget management to the tune of about $200 million in savings from what was proposed to be spent by your government. We've kind of tightened things up, or not tightened, but we just, you know, spent only what had to be spent. And so it's, uh, it's projected that there would be about $200 million savings in spending uh, during that period as well, and that comes to the billion dollars. Congressman. Yeah, well, one thing on that, if you remember a little over a year ago, some of the top rates and capital gains rates were increased quite a bit. And uh, 15% to 25% now. And a fair number of people uh, may have recognized capital gains at the lower rate before the <coughs> that year. So, one of the arguments that to me for a rainy day fund, I don't know if this is a permanent increase in revenue stream for the federal and at the state level, or maybe partly a permanent, but maybe partly one time because of people adjusting. And recognizing some gains at lower rates to, uh, to avoid uh, uh, changes in the tax code. So, uh, you know, we're being urged to be a little cautious about not assuming that good times will keep rolling all the time. I think another one of the, the things we're seeing in Wisconsin is in the last three, in the last two budgets, the last three years, uh, we have tried through tax laws that we changed and through regulatory reform to make Wisconsin a better place to do business, friendlier place to do business. And we're seeing the results of that. And, and people are hiring, uh, more people are going back to work, they're getting raises, and that's why we see the increase in, in the um, income tax and sales tax. The other thing we've seen is that as the economy starts improving, there's more trucks on the road. And a lot of the increase in the transportation budget has been because of uh, tax on diesel. Uh, that's where the biggest increase has been. So it, it's showing that if, if you um, make your state a place to do business, a place friendly to business, we're not trying to kick them out. Uh, we uh, we didn't raise uh, a warehouse tax like I did in Minnesota, and we got the, the where did uh, Amazon put the warehouse in Wisconsin? Uh, those types of actions that we take are reflected in, in some growth in, in the business uh, activity in Wisconsin, and we're starting to see results of that. Yes. What's the, uh, the, the proposed bill is to protect the user fees related to the transportation department. What are, what's the status of user fees in other areas? Like I think DNR uh, generates a tremendous amount of user fees. Are those protected as well? No. Um, some of us wanted to protect every segregated fund. Uh, but that wasn't going to happen. Um, the transportation fund, I mean, it should be a no-brainer with all of them. You know, if, you're, if you're a farmer and you pay a tax, as a, an additional surcharge on every bag of fertilizer for cleanup of fertilizer spills, that's where the money should go. Uh, and if there's too much money in there, we should lower that surcharge. Uh, but, but no, the other ones are not protected. And there's a lot, you're right, there's a lot of them. But overall, I mean, I think it's important to understand, in 2009 alone, taxes and fees in this state were raised by $3.14 billion. $3.14 billion taxes and fees. That was just in one year, 2009. Since 2011, 
we've had a decline in taxes and fees to the tune of almost $2 billion. So we're going the opposite direction of where we were, and we're trying to discipline, not only through the transportation protection amendment, but by disciplining ourselves that you know a fee should be for what it's supposed to go for. Another comment, too, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say this, um, but uh, lean government, when we're talking about bringing in extra revenues and things like that, I think there's an impact, even though we're probably still at taking our first early steps within the various agencies and state government. I know corrections has been looked at, and, and we're recouping a lot of extra dollars just by eliminating a lot of the different waste and abuse, and, and in some cases, fraud that's going on within state government. And, and I think that's going to continue to bear fruit just because we're there's so many agencies that haven't had a thorough look yet. So uh, I think that's just another, for me anyways, an important, uh, important item of knowing that, that, that our government is, is trying to run more lean and implementing lean uh, practices just like most businesses do as well. There's been some discussion, uh, talk radio, and there's a little bit of radio this morning about uh, certain sort of access there is a yeah there's a proposal that would so CCAP this is where public record of um, criminal activity is maintained on a database website that is available to the public the proposal is that if a um, if you were charged and the charge didn't come through to um, conviction, that the charge would appear on the website. I think that's what the proposal says. And um, all other convictions would be on there. Um, is it misdemeanors and felonies? Or felonies for sure. Yeah, uh, I would. <laughs> uh, so I don't know where that proposal's at. If it's got some legs to go through, I know there's concern with it. I think most people that have been contacting me over the past couple of days thinking that it may be taken up in the final days here are that they don't think we should restrict that information. I'm not sure if they really understand that it's just for cases that don't go to conviction that would be included. But I, I don't know if I see that getting through in the final couple of weeks of the legislature. And I support maintaining that public access to that information. It's a public record, and I do support maintaining that. That's it. Um, I have a few calls from some of our arts community that are from me, and there's good news on that front, I know. There's a great economy, and I was wondering if Mike might be part of the tourism committee when give us a report on that, because that seems to be a real positive. There's a, uh, a bill out right now, it's uh, Assembly Bill 760, uh, that it creates a, a, a grant program that would be administered by the Arts Board, which is a, a part of the, uh, the state's Department of Tourism. Uh, the bill requires the Arts Board to award, grant, uh, to award grants on a competitive basis to businesses, art organizations, local art agencies, um, and businesses that develop, or develop organizations and associations that work to promote the, the following items. Number one, individuals or organizations who, whose products or services have an origin in artistic, cultural, creative, or aesthetic content. Number two, job creation. And number three, economic development. And under this bill, such a grant um, may not exceed more than $40,000, and the bill prohibits the Arts Board from awarding a grant unless the proposed grant recipient has secured the non-state sources, uh, the, the non-state monies, if you will, uh, equal to that, uh, at least twice the amount of that. So it's a, we had a hearing on it, I think that was, was last week or the week before. Um, had a lot of artistic people there, you can just tell by some of the things they brought with them. Um, a lot of excitement. <laughs> and, um, like, like the economy's been here. Yeah, that's our yes, yes, um, So, I mean, I, I think it, especially for Chihuahua County, I mean, it kind of fits in with some of the things that we've done, some of the things we want to continue to do. Um, so, if, if you want more information on it, you let me know and I can, you know, give you some information to, to look into it. For, Okay. But I, I think that this is something that's going to be I think it has a little chance of moving because it's, it's going to help overall tourism and drive more revenues and having more visitors and things. Um, and it, it'll show off our, our 
Good ask about the transportation part of the gas tax. In Wisconsin, you used to index it to actually increase, I think, the cost of living. And the outlook with the cost of inflation and other things on it. Right. Gas prices have probably went up 35, 40 cents in the last couple of weeks around the state. I'm not sure who to blame for other things on that. <laughs> but <laughs> if, you more, if you need more, more funds for the roads and gas taxes are used as a user fee, and then we have to solve the issue with um, uh, hybrids and other things, is that an idea that's ever being talked about again? Or is that uh, heresy to bring up? <laughs> well, I, I think, at least for uh, myself and my colleagues in the assembly, uh, on the Republican side, we were not comfortable with the automatic indexing for two reasons. One, we weren't both on it. And it would be easy for us to say, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't raise your taxes, but somebody else did that a long time ago, and it's just automatically going up, don't believe me. And that, as the elected official, I don't think that's a good excuse. Uh, if, if I want it to go up, I should vote for it. Number two, a lot of us did not feel comfortable raising the gas tax when the money was going into the general fund. There's absolutely no way I was supporting an increase in the gas tax when it wasn't secured for what it was meant to be. Now, we can have that discussion after November, and if all you find people vote to, to restrict that money to where it's supposed to go in the Constitution, we can have that discussion. Up until then, I don't even want to have that discussion because it's not going to the place it's supposed to go to. Yeah, I was going to that kind of thought point is we go to more CMG for a lot of vehicles, particularly trucks on the highways. Will they be taxed? Uh, will there be a uh, gas tax applied to that? Or, how, or will they be skirting the uh, like electric vehicles today for CMG? You see, Quick Trip adopting an awful lot of compressed natural gas stations for long years. Maybe I'm talking about it. So, will they get taxed? Yeah, I mean, I'm very just, I'm a little thing. Quick Trip comes out all the time. They're spending about five hundred thousand dollars a pump, and they're putting it in. The real price of natural gas right now is about thirty cents a gallon on an energy equivalent basis of gasoline. Now, they, obviously, they got to pay for the pump and the infrastructure, so it'd be a couple of dollars, but it'd be quite a bit cheaper than. So everyone from Schneider Trucking, the UPS, <coughs> everyone and their brother is looking at this, and it's a little bit of a chicken and egg. But people like Quick Trip are going ahead and figuring. We're going, to, we're going to take the risk, put it in. It's going to happen pretty fast over the next five or ten years. There are new engines coming out. Again, they cost more at first, but, but so that, that's going to happen. Well, one of the things that's just maybe worth mentioning, uh, we've been having meetings and having people coming in from in Washington, coming in from different states, because every state, not Wisconsin, all over the world, be wrestling with it. A lot of states have been wrestling with how they're going to come up with their share. And, uh, 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 Virginia and a couple of other states, but what they've done is a little bit of a kind of, They've got rid of the gas tax, but they've subjected the gasoline to the sales tax. Uh, and then that is a way of indexing it. In effect, it's, it's, it's a percentage of the price of gasoline, and it kind of goes up and down as the price of gasoline is going to solve that whole, whole, whole element. Uh, Wyoming, which is so Dick Cheney country is 80% of Republican, very conservative, the lowest gas tax in the United States. They were paying for their roads through uh, 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 royalties on mineral rights and things, and they were declining. They had a long three-year debate, because they, they don't have mass transit there. They're driving 30,000 miles a, a year. They finally doubled their gas tax, because they figured it came to, they had to have their roads. Someone had to pay for it. Either they were going to do it, or they're going to send the bill to their kids by borrowing money. Responsible thing was to, it wasn't popular, but it's been well accepted, I'm told, uh, after they.